Well, welcome everyone to Friday Talks. My name is Jose Leal and I'm a co-founder of Society 2045. We are seeking a positive vision for the year 2045 by bringing pioneering voices together to make the future that we all want to see. And today our special guest is Harini Srinivasan. Hopefully I pronounced that well. Perfect. Welcome Harini. Hi, glad to be here, Jose. So Harini, we, you, you know the format. We wanna know about what you think the future is going to be like, uh, but initially, we ask a little bit about who are you, what are you doing to make that vision a reality? Okay, so uh, the, the story goes actually long back into my childhood. Uh, that's because that's what makes me what I am. And that's what makes me part of this movement and uh, a piece of that vision. Um, as, as, a, as a child uh, growing up in the Eastern Hemisphere, a very typical question that any child is asked is, what is it that you want to be when you grow up? Uh, and it's a favorite question and uh, all of us have great answers. So as, as children, uh, we, we dream a lot, we, have, we, we visualize what we want to be and we come up with some amazing answers. And then we are put into an education system which kinds of defines our paths and it tells us what is it that you have to do. Uh, there are rules, there are uh, do's and don'ts. You pick your choice based on uh, the scores you get, the grades you get. And then suddenly uh, what you want to be when you grow up, the answer that you gave as a child is lost somewhere. A very similar thing happened with me. Uh, as a child, my answer to that question was, uh, I wanna make a positive difference to people around me. Uh, and that was, a, that was a very philosophical answer because uh, as a six-year-old or maybe even younger, I didn't know uh, what profession would actually make me achieve that. Along the way, I figured out and I thought, okay, maybe I should be a medical practitioner. Uh, that didn't work uh, for several reasons. Uh, I didn't fit into the box that the education system was actually defining for me. Uh, uh, there was a lot of, you know, victimization because of corrupt practices, so on and so forth. And somewhere down the line, I, I, I still held on to that purpose, which I had created for myself as a child. And no matter what I did, uh, I started trying to move a step towards that purpose. So I moved in to become uh, a pharmaceutical scientist. I was in research and development, and I thought I was getting to where I wanted to be. And suddenly I figured out that, no, I'm not because, uh, you know, the, the I was working on synthesis of nanomolecules, nanomolecules for nanosurgery. Uh, I thought by the time I see the change in, in someone who is receiving these medicines, I don't know if it is something that I have discovered. So there's, there's no connection between what I'm doing and a positive difference in people's lives. And, and in a bureaucratic organization uh, in that industry, I felt extremely frustrated, strangulated. So I said, no, this is not taking me a step towards my purpose of wanting to make that positive difference. And I said, okay, let me try experimenting with myself. And I did a lot of different things, moved into studying behaviors because what I felt was, uh, uh, you know, if I have to get to the root of things, I have to understand how people behave in organizations, how, how organizational culture develops. What is it that happens when people come into the organization and when they leave, so on and so forth. I thought, Behavioral sciences is, is a space where I can understand more of this. Got me intrigued. I started uh, certifying myself in, in behavioral sciences. I started studying courses in neuroscience. Uh, a legitimate place in the corporate world to practice behavioral science, to me, appeared to be human resources. So that's why I, I am a human resource professional for a major part of my career, apart from my pharmaceutical days. Uh, I have been in human resources pretty much by chance. I don't think that was my choice. My choice still remains what I said when I was a five-year-old or six-year-old. I still want to make a difference, a positive difference in, in, the, in the quality of life of people around me. So that remained like my pole star. And no matter what I did, uh, I went on navigating my way through, through reaching this and over a period of time, I think the last three years have been extremely fruitful in that space. I work with organizations transforming the way work happens. Um, we don't call it management consulting. 
we don't call it culture transformation we basically work with people to so that they make life in their organizations more meaningful uh so that's that's something that i've been doing for the last 3 years bringing with me a lot of neuroscience ex- experience uh, a lot of behavioral science experience a little bit of human resources uh, of what should not be done uh, removing all those uh, you know cliched practices and all of that and another uh, thing that i do alongside this which actually runs parallelly is uh, i work uh, very very passionately about you know i'm i'm a crusader for zero suicides among students and young professionals uh, because that's an alarming number and uh, when i when i tried to understand why it's happening it it made a lot of sense that these are all connected things if youngsters are not able to take stress at the workplace or in their uh, uh, academia then there's something fundamentally wrong in the way work works so uh, the last almost 3 years i've been working very closely with the sempo style institute team in india uh, and i work are part of the global team as well and that's how i met catherine and uh, what we do is we, we take organization by organization try and understand where they are when it comes to dealing with people uh, are we creating meaningful purposeful organizations and uh, yes that's my journey uh, extremely extremely exciting a wakeful 20 21 hours every day uh, inching towards my purpose Yeah, and I can go on and on with this question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's beautiful. Thank you. And and you've told me already how little sleep you need. So, uh, yeah, twenty 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 one hours is. is uh, I understand now uh, uh, how that's possible. Um, so, it's as if you've gone back to that childhood passion that you answered right away. Have you thought about? what you would have answered as a child to how you want the world to be how you want the world to be when you grow up rather than what do you want to do when you grow up yeah actually uh, it's an interesting question so if i if i go back to and i often do that i go back and reflect uh, in the past and when i do that my probable answer to that question would have been uh, that the world uh, would be a much better place than what it is today uh, without uh, without uh, i wouldn't have used words like war and things like that because uh, that was really not not the kind of language we were speaking at home but i would definitely would have spoken about a world where there was a lot of harmony uh, there was purpose and meaning for every creation on this on the planet and uh, Uh, no hunger for power uh, i think these were three things i would have visualized the world in the future uh, had i been asked this question as a child and and today now how do you see now we chose 2045 when it was 25 years away uh it's now 23 years away um how do you see the future based on the work that you're doing and the the things that you're striving to to make a change in uh i'm an eternal optimist uh so for me if if i've if i've been noticing uh, a little bit of change in the last 3 years uh, and that's what's keeping me going uh i would believe that th- this change will be exponential from this point forward so the year 2045 to me is is going to is is if i visualize it today it is going to be a place where uh, each individual is driven by a purpose uh, and there probably are no rules that restrict anyone um, i would think that there would be more tools around uh, which enable people to do what they want to do so rules are restricting and tools uh, are usually enabling they, they just give you Uh, equipment in your hand tools are equipment in your hand which you can use to make your own path so uh, i visualize your 2020 2045 as as a place where ev- people feel empowered uh, they feel that they are drivers of their destiny they're able to uh, you know pave the path that they want to walk upon without being uh, constrained by rules that's that's my vision for 2045 well that that's very uh consistent with with mine so i i i really like that um but but how do you think it works how do you think we make that work 
how do we get rid of rules then and and replace them with tools and what are these tools that we need to um, I, to replace them I, with? I actually see the pandemic as an opportunity for us to drive home this point uh, speaking from an Indian context uh, speaking from I would say most part of the eastern hemisphere uh, from this context when I uh, look at what the pandemic has given us when I look at the positives with due respects to all those people who have lost their lives, dear ones, jobs, whatever. But if I look at the positive side of it, what is it that we take away as a learning from the pandemic is I think it has brought to the surface the aspect of trust. Uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in this part of the world where uh, we are still driven by uh, proximity uh, to the manager, proximity or being visible at work uh, as something which is is, which is what people would prefer. Uh, I think the pandemic has helped us to overnight change the way we think about work, how work has to be carried out. So it, it's, it's a good starting point for us to get on this to this journey of uh, removing rules and restrictions and providing people with better tools and uh, equipment for them to make their own way ahead. So there are a lot of learnings from the pandemic. What happened to productivity? If I generally talk to people, businesses continued. Uh, people really didn't have much of a problem. Uh, what they missed was actually getting back to office and working with their colleagues. But if you look at it from a business continuity perspective, nothing changed. People learned the tricks. Uh, managers learned how to deal with their team members remotely. Micromanagement was not possible, but still work happened. So I think trust, which was hidden somewhere, dormant, uh, suddenly came up out there. Power distance got reduced. Can you ever imagine a co Zoom conference where you have somebody sitting at the head of the table? It's not possible. So the, the tools that we have been using during the uh, remote working days, they're all helping us to reduce power distance. Uh, the pandemic has been a great leveler of sorts. So I think we are we are actually poised at a, at a great starting point towards that journey. Uh, it's just that we have to keep reiterating and we have, to keep, we have to keep enforcing this on people's minds and their way of thinking that we have already changed. We have taken that first step. We have started treating humans as humans. Uh, we have started moving far away from hierarchical or bureaucratic hierarchy. Uh, we have started making radical changes to the way we work. And now there's no looking back. And we keep building on this. And then our 2045 is, is, is definite and certain. So I think uh, various tools that we need to get there is simply bring about, uh, you, know, you know, let people understand how transactional analysis really works. Get people to understand how important this, it is to treat adults as adults, how important it is to bring transparency in conversations, how important it is to reduce power distance, uh, busting bureaucracy. And how do you do that? How do you, how do you bring innovation? How do you do that is you, you, you layer it, you do it bit by bit. Uh, you can't create a, a drastic change overnight. So we, we are already on that journey. It's just that we have to keep moving forward without looking back. That's awesome. Uh, the looking forward part and, and the fact that it is about it's about slowly accruing different changes and different thoughts and different ideas and, and get evolving to something. How, can you give me a, a bit of a day in the life of someone at work 23 years from now? What does that look like to you? Um, not, not the structures necessarily, but what is, what is the person seeing, feeling, living differently in 23 years than, than the average person today? Okay, uh, interesting question. Uh, I think uh, something that's, that's definitely going to disappear in 23 years is, uh, is what we call as work-life balance. Uh, is that, that's something which is not making sense to me even today. Uh, you know, so definitely 23 years in the future, we are going to be a lot wiser. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of uh, data, we've got a lot of information, we've got a lot of knowledge with us, and now it's time for us to get that wisdom. And we've started building on that wisdom. So I think work-life balance is something which is not going to exist in 2045. 
uh, by which what I mean is that each of us has 24 hours in a day. Nobody has less, nobody has more. And each of us has several things to do. It's about how we prioritize what we want to do and how we accomplish things during the day. And I think that's going to be a typical day in the life of somebody in 2045. For example, uh, if I'm very passionate about classical dancing, today or probably a couple of years in, in the past, I would have had to create time for it. I work nine to 10 hours every day at, at an office. I get home, manage my house. On the weekends, I spend an hour or two learning classical dance, practicing classical dance, performing on stage, but I have only the weekends for it. And I'm actually trying to balance work and life. But I think uh, I've already started making the change. So I'm sure 2045 is possible because I'm already living that change now or started to. So in 2045, I don't have to really calculate how many hours I'm going to be at work and how many hours I'm going to be doing what I love doing. I just have several things to do in 24 hours in a day and I'm going to prioritize based on what the day demands of me. I'm going to drive my day and that's that's how my day is going to look like. So I might want I might walk into a, a dance recital, watch a dance recital, make my notes, get back to work, finish a couple of meetings, uh, uh, head back to a library, do some research on classical dance, get back to work, finish some emails, all of it because I'm not going to be constrained by rules of swiping in, swiping out and marking your attendance every now and then. Because by the time we would have learned uh, the wisdom of what it means to be working from anywhere, as long as we know what's the outcome we need to deliver. So I think work-life balance is going to completely disappear uh, and that would define a typical day. That's a good example because I think part of the reason we talk about work-life balance is because a lot of people get caught up in their work in a way that they don't have any life uh, in today's world, right? To the point where they kind of lose touch of, of their own living. And um, so we then say, oh, well, you need to have a balance. It's as if we're uh, coining that term to, in order to to be able to um, describe the failure of, yes. of our work system today. Yes. So what you've described there leads me to, to wonder about what changed at, in your organization. You talk about no more time clocks uh, and no more, you know, you got to check in and check out. Um, so in order for that to work, what happens? How, how does the, the average employee now have the freedom? Um, do we have employees? Do we still have employees in, in, in 2045? Um, what does that look like? How, how does that freedom come about is I guess what I'm trying to ask. Uh, so in, in 2045, uh, I, I don't know what we will call uh, people who are associated with organizations, we may not call them employees, we may call them uh, team members, we may call them partners. Uh, an organization could have 40,000 partners because everybody is a, a stakeholder in the business. So uh, why call anybody an employee? Because when you say employee and employer, you're actually building power distance. Those the terminologies like this, uh, which which actually are indicative of power distance will may not be there, uh, will not be there. Let's, let's be uh, positive and let's be optimistic. Uh, we could have partners across, every organization could have partners across, across the world. Now, how does, and what is it that drives people to be partners in the business and not consider themselves as employees is, uh, now I picked this up from one of our earlier conversations, Jose, so a credit goes to you uh, and, and it really has made a deep impact in my mind. Organizations will start creating a need for people to be a part of that big, uh, big organization or to be a part of that uh, ecosystem rather than forcing them to operate within rules. So when, when, when people join an organization as partners, uh, they are not bound or they are not forced into the system, but a need is created for them to be a part of that system. So if I look at an organization in 2045 as a, as a, as a huge drama stage, 
okay and everyone is playing a role there uh, so nobody is bound by a script all that the actors on that stage are told that this is the ultimate message we want to give to our audience this is the message we want to give to the world now you do your your part the way you believe in it and everyone there is consistently talking or, or delivering dialogues to convey the same message so i think 2045 is going to have partners every business is going to have partners across the globe um power distance symbols jargons terminologies will will not be existing and you know force gets replaced by need uh, the force and need concept is is yours so i borrowed it from you <laughs> well thank you for borrowing it and i'm i'm glad that you did um the <clears throat> the question that i think is the hard question for us is how do we get there because you've been doing this for 3 years um and we've been doing this ourselves uh, about the same time and lots of people have been doing this for for a number of years uh, people uh say like um well simco uh did it in the 80s um and our, our friend uh Doug Kirkpatrick who who did it uh, back in the 90s yes. and so forth yes. um this is some of these things are not new um many of these things are not new we're not really inventing much we're simply collecting a lot of different experiences the question is how does those things mature to the point that you've just described um uh, how do we get there and what what keeps us from getting there possibly Yeah, I, I think one is uh, some of these things they seem uh, to be too good to be true. Uh, so, incidentally, uh, Doug Kirkpatrick is a good friend of mine as well, and uh, we work together on a lot of Simco initiatives. So, uh, in some of the conversations with him, also we realize this that it's a lot of people are not aware of what's wonderful about these philosophies. So, what's really preventing us from moving there or or making our movement visible is that. people aren't aware and we can't believe that it's it's going to be a better world uh you know because hierarchy bureaucracy all of these things we have, we have grown with it it may be slightly different shades in different parts of the world but we we born with it uh, we've always been told look up to people who are older than you uh, respect who are uh, you know the names and of the people who are in the boxes in the org charts org charts that, that you look at so we've we've grown with all of that so it's not very easy for us to make that radical change and it's important for each one of us to celebrate these small success stories so when you talk about organizations that have started on that journey uh and and you know talk about it in in conversations like this uh, publish all of these uh as as uh, case studies as as books from our experience and and let the world know that people have started on this journey they have made progress and they're already living a much better life uh and unless we keep talking about it this change is going to take a really long time to happen because any change for that matter is not easy and here we are talking about fundamental changes in the way in the way people think the way people think work is uh, we're actually trying to tell people that work is not work work is life uh no if if work is life you've got to live uh, as you work now that's the that's the drastic thing we're talking about so it's not going to happen easily it's it's not possible for people to imagine that uh so i think uh, publicizing this making people aware that's on 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 the one hand on the other hand actually helping people practice uh the ways of working so that uh, these changes become evident and uh, there's always this question of what's in it for me So as long as we keep answering this, what's in it for me to everybody, uh, you know, and that's how we start converting the force to a need. I think the change will happen. So we still have twenty three years to go. I'm happy with what is with the change that I'm seeing in the last three years of very conscious effort. Before that, the effort was definitely there in in my last twenty five years, but the last three years it has been conscious effort. So with conscious effort, if I'm if we're able to see a need, the needle move. the fact that we are all getting together here and talking about the same purpose uh, paints a very positive picture for us to look at in 2045 23 years is a long time we'll get there yeah it's always uh, in my experience when i worked in uh, in the digital space 
um, I remember us talking back in the early 2000s about um, mobile phones and the internet on the mobile phones. And we, every year we'd say, oh, it's it's coming. It's around the corner. It's around the corner. And then at some point we gave up. We're like, okay, internet on mobile phones is never going to come. And then poof, there it was. And it just hijacked everything. So I think we're getting close to a tipping point. Yes. Um, I suspect um, yes. there will be one of these years um, a tipping point. It may be this year yes. because a lot is happening uh, right now. Uh, it may be this year, but uh, definitely we're going to see a tipping point at some point. And uh, when that happens, I think it will be a, we will be wondering, what, what were we thinking about wondering why it wasn't going to happen uh, and why it was happening. So thank you for that, because that was, uh, that was, I think, very well stated as far as what we need to do, how we need to just simply continue this and 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 um, allow for time for it to spread, for people to to get used to it, for people to understand that we're talking about something as fundamental, not about necessarily the change or only the change of organizational structures, only the change of of how we define people's roles and so on and so forth, but a fundamental change in how people see themselves and see work and see their lives and see the role of themselves in the world. And that's, a, that's, I think, what you've just described. That's the fundamental change we're talking about. It's, it's not a, a simple thing of, of changing a whole bunch of corporate structures and organizational structures and how we govern ourselves and so forth, and everything will be done. We need to really fundamentally change how people see work. So what could keep that from happening? What, you, what potentially could happen that would slow down or stop this progress that we're seeing in this space? Yeah, um, if, if, we, if we shift our focus from the outcome that we want to see, uh, if we shift it from the outcome to the outputs, or if we shift it to, to what we are doing as various steps, I think that can become a deterrent to the process. So it's, it's very, very important for us to stay focused on the outcome. And uh, you know, keep that as as the destination in, on the GPS, and then build our way towards it. The moment we shift our focus away from the outcome and start looking at the outputs or what we are delivering in the journey, I think we might get lost, and that could <clears throat> become a deterrent to, to our progress. I'm saying this a little bit from my personal experience. Uh, the childhood question, um, somewhere in the back of my mind, uh, the, the my, my final destination, my goal. That didn't change at all. No matter what career decision I took, uh, no matter what path I chose, uh, ultimately I, I kept looking at at the outcome that I wanted to uh, the outcome that I wanted to deliver as a, as a human being. And I wasn't really measuring each step because if, if I actually get down to look at each step, I've had many failures. Uh, I've, I've done miserably several times. I've, I've gone through a, a lot of bad patches throughout that but since my focus from the outcome did not change I finally found myself getting there so I think what could be a deterrent is if we if we shift that focus and start looking at transactional things and the small steps that we are taking uh, by completely losing focus of the outcome I think uh, it becomes a deterrent and that's many a time a mistake that organizations also eventually do you know we we don't focus on the outcome we, we start looking at the inputs we start looking at the outputs and business outcomes get forgotten. And then you, you realize that you have lost your uh, momentum towards that journey. So I think that would be a deterrent. Yeah, I like to think about it uh, as impact um, because uh, whatever the impact is, is the impact. And you can look at outcomes, you can look at, at inputs and outputs and all that good stuff. But um, yeah, the impact is, uh, is, is really the ultimately the, the thing that matters because how people are impacted, how the world is impacted, how earth is impacted is yes. ultimately what matters. And, is, and, and, and there's one more one more point which I just wanted to touch upon here and that's that's a fundamental uh, uh, way Semco style also works and uh, I must uh, talk about it and it's, uh, you know, we don't try and change or touch on, on the symptoms of a problem statement. Uh, we actually work on the on the fundamental 
human behavior that is driving that particular culture. So if I give an analogy, uh, it's not as simple as changing a costume. You actually get into the into the brain of the character and change the way the person is playing that role. It's it's as complicated as that. It's not as simple as changing a costume. So if you look at any transformation that we do, it's not about giving you certain tools and templates to to start working differently from tomorrow, but it's it's a it's a it's an endeavor to make you think differently so that you live those values. And that's why it's it's a tough journey. It's not as simple as changing a costume. So if, if we good. don't work on driving a change mindset, uh, it will again become a deterrent to that progress. I really like the analogy of the costume, right? Because it looks different from the outside, but you really haven't changed much of anything, have you? That's really great. Um, is there? I, I want to give some time for the other folks to ask questions. Um, is there a um, anything else you want to talk about your vision of the future or or how we get there uh, before we do that? Um, I, I just have one point to make. Uh, also, we are we are, we have just twenty three years and time is slipping away like sand, and we have a lot to do. We're talking about a transformation across the globe. Uh, I think it's important for us to synchronize thoughts, words, and action at all times. So uh, as, as, as people passionately working in this area, uh, we have to be very authentic uh, when, we, when we talk about these things and uh, people should see us you know, synchronizing thoughts, words, and actions. And when we do that, uh, it's also important for us to look at it from two perspectives. Uh, look at culture change in organizations, how we drive that, how we change mindsets, and also look at the generation that is coming out of colleges now, coming out of universities and is going to put their foot into the corporate world, uh, you know, how are they going to actually transition there? Are they going to jump into uh, the mess that has already been created or are they going to be conscious of it and drive a change as they enter the corporate world? So I, I think it has to be an endeavor from our side to work with different people, different age groups, so that the change happens at both ends and it seamlessly moves because we're we are going to be looking at multi-generational workforce. So it's not enough if we if we try to drive this change only from the baby boomers or the Gen X. I think it's also important for us to inculcate this mindset in the millennials so that when they enter the enter the workforce, they're actually bringing in a different <coughs> mindset. You know, it's like blood transfusion. So it sounds like what you're saying is we need to do this at the educational system, not just the oh, work yes. system. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. I couldn't agree more with what you say about the fundamental change it has to be people's change of mindset in terms of their relationship to work, how they hold work, how they see work, um, because that's kind of critical. You know, if people see work as a place where there's a boss who's going to either tell them what to do or um, criticize what they're doing uh, or someone they report to, someone to be feared, uh, which is, you know, kind of a, a mindset that a lot of people have. Can you be a little bit more specific about how we make that shift? You know, both from the, quote, <laughs> formerly known as employees' mindsets <laughs> and formerly known as management mindset how do we how do we make that mindset shift in both of those places it, 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 it is a journey uh, so what you can't expect to see change quickly it's definitely a journey so i think uh, psychological safety at the workplace is is still a, a very much research and a very popular topic and we've all trying been trying to practice it in so many ways and we've all figured out that it's not easy because uh, many managers they come with a baggage of bad managers that they might have experienced. Uh, so one is they need to be they need to be coached to forget uh, either either forget bad managers that they have met or uh, talk to them about how bad managers made their life difficult and what they can do to become better managers. So a lot of coaching 
uh, with managers is required to be done so that they understand what psychological safety is. Psychological safety is not as simple as just being able to uh, voice your views. Uh, there's a lot more to it than just that. It's it's speaking without fear of uh, fear of consequence. It is experimenting without fear of failure. And unless uh, somebody in the organization who has that uh, power in his hands to build an environment which which brings about psychological safety, unless that happens, you cannot expect uh, new entrants into the system to suddenly start acting. Uh, feeling very safe so there's someone who's 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 custodian of the culture in the organization they could be managers what we call as managers now they might be called as coaches uh, in 2045 they might be called as uh, senior partners or experienced partners or whatever but i think they they need to understand that they have to move away from management and they have to become coaches they have to build psychologically safe spaces for their teams and only then they will see psychological safety happening so it starts from the top, but at the same time, what, what new entrants into the system need to do so that they, they do not misuse the power that is given to them is they need to understand the consequences of their action. They need to be a lot more mindful. So I think, uh, you know, coaching both the groups, both the age groups, uh, people who have been in the system and people who are just entering, coaching both of them to be one is to let go and the other to be mindful of consequences and to make meaningful decisions. I think all of that has to happen simultaneously. Just to punctuate something, you know, what I have found is true, moving from um, one domain to another domain to another area, it's always about learning a new language. And what I mm. appreciate about what you just articulated is, what I'm hearing is, let's change the language of business and organizations. So thank you for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, it certainly does start, start with how we discuss things, right? How we yes. frame things, because if we frame things differently, then that starts to change how we act as well. Uh, any other questions? Um, I know that you've done some amazing, you know, if the word transformations or, you know, evolving organizations. And working with a lot of different people and people with different education and skills backgrounds. And I'm just, I'm curious if you could, you know, help us see when these changes are made, how that has affected individuals that previously thought that they could not really participate in the kind of thing that we're talking about now. But in fact, through your guidance, they have made some of these changes. And, you know, I'd love to hear some of the stories about that. Yeah, so I had this uh, wonderful experience of working with a housekeeping company, uh, a large 5,000 people strong housekeeping company. 95% uh, of the workforce uh, comes from uh, a very poor economic background and they are either illiterate or even, I mean, partially literate or maybe even illiterate. First several months of conversations with them, uh, I was shocked because, uh, you know, the lack of exposure to decision making, uh, because they come with, uh, you know, they, they come from a poor economic background, the lack of exposure to decision, organizational decision making had actually brought in a lot of self doubt in themselves. So as, as human beings, they were slowly losing the ability to make choices in their own lives. And to me, that was shocking because that's what our systems do to people. Uh, they sometimes bring in a lot of self-doubt because uh, you know systems make people follow rules. Uh, they, 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 they encourage us to take delegation instructions and not use our own minds. But over a, a year or year and a half, and after several rounds of conversations with them, when, when we actually got down to working with them very closely and giving them small projects to work on, uh, providing them with information, uh, helping them make decisions, take decisions, make choices. And when, when they saw success happening, it made a huge transformation on their self-esteem. Uh, for a moment, let's forget the business outcomes. Let forget, let's forget their career growth and all of that. Let's look at them as human beings. What it did to them is they understood that they have an ability to 
to, to, to take decisions, they have an ability to make choices. And they started looking and evaluating their own lives. And to a, to a point that they were able to look into the future, draw a roadmap for themselves, for their children as well. Uh, six months ago, same individual, when I asked uh, him, what is it that your daughter is going to do now that she's in school? He had no answer. But today, when he is able to make decisions, uh, he says that he's going to give her an exposure into these areas and she will and he will help her make her choice. So I think it has brought about a tremendous self-esteem improvement in them and confidence levels have gone up. And obviously, that's going to translate uh, at the workplace. So I think that that will be a very nice consequence for, for employers and for businesses. But as human beings, it makes their life a lot more purposeful. And, and that's what is very fulfilling for me uh, personally. Yeah, I just want to add just one mm -hmm. little small comment. And I love that story because it shows that it's like the grains of sand or the chemical reaction, right? As the water heats up and starts to boil, it's not just this one atom that changes, but it bounces around all of them. And, and how that interaction that you've had changes that family and it's going to change you know, more broadly with that as it goes along. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Catherine. I'll, I'll pass on to Kim for uh, her question. Comment. I, so I have a background in working in domestic violence shelters, and we learned a lot about learned helplessness. Mm. And, ha and, 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 and so we had, one of the things, like we had to teach women to use the telephone again and, 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 and things like that. And uh, it, the parallels are just... Uh, interesting to me because that was you know like they had lost their uh, autonomy they had lost their authority over their own lives and they had to be retaught and so i'm just, I'm just really um not a question but a comment and an idea that uh that there might be some cross uh learning to do there uh i found a, a very strong link uh with uh, domestic violence issues because Fundamentally, that's what it is. When, when your self-esteem gets completely shaken, when confidence is shattered, uh, you use the you 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 lose your rational thinking, and that's what happens. Uh, whether it is a case of domestic violence or it is a case of uh, being suppressed at the workplace, or just being told that you just follow instructions, don't think. So any of these, these are just various shades of the of the same same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely a strong linkage and. We're all talking about ultimately making, uh, you know, quality of life uh, more meaningful and purposeful for in human beings. So that is definitely a strong image. Yeah, the image that that leaves in my mind is is the idea that workplaces are violent places for us in many cases, right? When it comes to our ability to do things that we want to do. And and a lot of this violence at the workplace is invisible. Uh, it's, it's, it cannot be categorized, it cannot be measured, you cannot, you may not even be able to show any evidence as violence, but it definitely leaves deep scars in people's minds. Uh, and if, if we go back and look at our own stories, we'll also find them. One of the pieces of the domestic violence world is the power and control wheel. Mm. And having control over your um, economic survival is one of the ways that people are abused. And so I, I'm, I'm seeing another parallel there. Yes, that, you know, yes. If, you know, but if, if you are going to, your family is going to starve if you do not comply, then that, yes. that's violence. Yes. It, you know, it might be, not be the kind of violence where you're slapped or whatever, but that is violence. Exactly. There are parallels, so many parallels, absolutely. Stuart, you, you have another question and you're on mute. Just picking up on what 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 Kim just said, is I was just writing about it this week, this whole notion of um, golden handcuffs in the in the in the form of um, health insurance, uh, it, it in some way is a form of violence perpetuating um, a feudal system. But Harini, what what I what I heard what I heard you say with the changes and empowerment of individuals was something that I believed for the last many many years that organizations and business could be a, a huge cultural force given the decline or change in families and changes in people's religious orientations. I don't know if that's as true in the East as it is in the West, but it's a, it's a huge opportunity that 
here in the West, not enough organizations have capitalized on. Any thoughts about, about that? Um, I think it's, it's pretty similar. I don't see much of a change uh, in, in the Eastern Hemisphere when it comes to this. Uh, organizations haven't really capitalized uh, on it. I, I agree with you. And there's a huge amount of opportunity there. I'm also fascinated about the cultural piece. Um, the, um, so again, I, I, I taught domestic violence um, advocacy to mediators in, um, in India. And so mm. I, 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 have, um, I have looked into this pretty, pretty deeply. And one mm. of the things um, that I saw was that uh, divorce is very, very rare. And mm. domestic violence is very, very common, and um, and 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 so I wonder about you know that. And then when when someone does divorce, they are shunned. Mm. Uh, mm. The woman is because mm. she she's a failure. And I'm wondering um, if there's a cultural pressure on the status quo of this is the way we should do things. And if you are not fitting into that model, that, um, that you're gonna have some consequences. Yeah, it is, uh, I, I won't say that uh, that's, that's very common uh, in, in terms of uh, such extreme situations, that's, that's not so common, but what's, uh, what's really the crux of the whole thing is a lot of, uh, there's, there are power symbols there are unwritten rules and non-compliance has a consequence. Now, yeah. if I just pick up these, these phrases and put them in the corporate world, it's pretty much the same. So in the corporate world, there are rules, there are power symbols, there are uh, unwritten consequences uh, for non-compliance. So it's, 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 it's pretty much the same thing. So from a, from a human behavior perspective, I think it's important to let, to make people aware of uh, what they are as human beings, their power as human beings, because I believe everybody has potential, everybody has a certain superpower. It's just that people are not aware and uh, they, they succumb to uh, control by somebody. But if you're able to bring that superpower out in each individual, if you're able to unlock that potential, uh, then whether it is in a workplace or whether it is uh, in, in the home front, uh, I think it, it would have the same magical uh, effect and, and therefore I'm beginning to believe that uh, it's these changes are not restricted to organizations these changes are restricted to human beings uh, they, I mean, yeah. they, they include human beings not restricted to organizations and uh, that's that's how our perspective should be uh, because it, it, we, we are not here only to change organizations we're here to change mindsets so we can't have people coming to the workplace with a different mindset and then going home with a different mindset. And, and we wouldn't be really be able to drive that change. Um, thank you, Hariri. And, and we're about a minute off uh, and Vinay has a question. So I'd love to have uh, Vinay jump in. Uh, so no, I don't have a question per se. I just wanted to say something just uh, just a thought that you know when we talk about the organization you know as Harini was talking about uh, changes how uh, employees are motivated to perform so I have been uh, I've been reading a lot about the motivational theory so the typical traditional motivational theories that we used to read and think uh, they don't work now if we are talking about the future and this is where I felt that uh, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure you must have heard about the Daniel Pink's theory of uh, intrinsic motivation, uh, action, purpose, mastery. And that is something which is way to go. Uh, because now the, the days have gone when we talk about intrinsic motivation, awarding, uh, you know, giving some rewards, rewards, and then motivating people to go ahead. If we are talking about future, the individual has to be self-motivated. The individual has to be motivated to the extent that he wants to achieve mastery. And that is where I think uh, you know, we should be going. Uh, the whole, whole theory of motivation today, uh, you know, earlier theory of motivation today is flawed at this point of time. Just wanted to add that, nothing else. Well said. Yeah, very well said. Thank you for that. That's a great way to 
to end the conversation because at the end of the day, it the only motivation we really have is what we call intrinsic motivation. Um, extrinsic motivation is a nice thing to say, but it really is force. <laughs> Somebody's, <laughs> somebody's yes. forcing you to do force. something. Yes. Uh, yes. Whether it's really nice force or not, it is force. So thank you so much, Vinay, for, for pointing that out. And thank you, Hidini, for, for coming and visiting uh, and spending this time with us and, and uh, telling us what your vision of the future is and uh, how you'd like to get there. It's a um, really wonderful conversation. I wish it could go longer, but maybe another time. Yes. Thank you. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much. It was wonderful meeting every with some of you meeting again. So I really happy.